Hello, I am back from my winter break. Not like I go to college or anything. I just took off uh, Christmas and New Year's cause I felt like it. All three of my fans, you know how it is. I take pretty frequent breaks between uploads. Enough waffling as the British say. Why am I here today? Well, if you've read the title that I don't know what I made it because I'm not that planned out with my videos. I kind of do these things on the fly. So the subject of today's video, because I recorded 10 videos to my hard drive from the Switch, it's 10 Nintendo Switch eShop games that are, for the most part, under $5. There's one exception, and you'll see it sooner rather than later. Like with the last format of this video, I'm not gonna go in alphabetical order. I'm just gonna go in whatever order I see fit. Now keep in mind, you gotta factor in sales tax. Depending on where you live, it might be well over $5, because my sales tax in my state is 7%, that being Indiana, but other states vary wildly. If you're not in America, the prices are different per region anyway, so just disregard it if you're not in America because I'm using American currency because I am an elitist. USA! USA! Basically, I am kind of peeved that I even have to pay sales tax for freaking digital goods because sales tax is meant to be used to pay for goods that are imported into the state that you live in. And what are you importing with a digital good? One that takes no physical effort to move to my state besides the sort of internet that would require me downloading it or me me buying it, but regardless, fuck off government, taxation is theft. God damn, I said no waffling from this point forward, but I totally lied. Anyway, let's get to the first game that I would recommend you buy on the eShop for under $5, especially if it's on sale. That being Draw Rider Remake. Draw Rider Remake is a game of which I have shown many times throughout my channel, and especially on my secret second channel. For once, you're getting a raw look at what actual gameplay without the sort of trial and error that I constantly have to go through to get the perfect clips for my uh, videos looks like. Now, I believe Draw Rider actually was originally a Flash game in the same vein as Line Rider, as well as a Happy Wheels. Time to the realities. Now, the game has plenty of community levels that you can play. Now, I know this game is also on PC, so I'm imagining that, uh, Making levels on PC is much easier, but I'm assuming you can do it on Switch, maybe not, I don't know. Too lazy to look it up. I do think the game's community section is cross-platform. I do think you can play the PC-made levels on Switch and vice versa. Damn it, why the fuck are you scratching the window? Like, what, what do you expect me to do? Like, let you jump out the window? Anyway, sorry about that. The community levels are of varying quality, some of which don't even freaking work on Switch, like straight up. I think there's like a zoom out function you can do on PC, but I found know where to do it on switch now um you can play custom made levels by the developer in a, a sort of career style mode or i guess a campaign if you will like basically any sort of level pack you'd find in a flash game turn real game like n plus plus if you will got all the hallmarks of all the classic flash games it's got the sled from the previously mentioned line rider just like happy wheels it's got like a segue and a bicycle it has like a motorcycle just like trial it's got a monster truck like those other flash games that are similar to trials You got one where you're just supposed to make it to the end You got one where you're supposed to collect a certain amount of stars And if you do that then you beat the level and you got like a score based mode Where you try to do the most tricks without wiping out in comical ways with blood everywhere and your head falling off Similar to Happy Wheels Again, the game is very derivative in what it's trying to do It's definitely a YouTuber type game One that will definitely get people a lot of views if they show it although me not so much because my channel is floundering you only really need to beat the level in order to make it to the next section but i love getting those gold medals i am super happy to try over and over again failing multiple times and i don't rage at all i have plenty of fun doing this because i am a patient bastard but really only when it comes to these kind of games because otherwise i am super impatient and i wish i wasn't in that regard because my life would be so much better there's cosmetics in the game some of which you can unlock by exploring the level level in a different way. I typically don't bother because I just like getting to the end and getting the best score or getting the best time like I said before. The graphics are whatever. The music is great. I think it might be from somewhere else 
but either way I really like it. I'm glad they chose the music that they did. The sort of relaxing atmosphere the music gives combined with the satisfying sound effects of beating a level really make for a oddly zen experience. God, we're only five minutes into the video? Jesus, we need to move on. This game is the game I said I'd get to eventually and that time is now. It's the game that's over five dollars. It's actually five ninety nine. It's uh, Throne Quest Deluxe. It's a game like Diablo. It's kind of a Diablo clone. It's a game with pixel art with a pseudo 3D sort of style where your character moves back and forth in a static sort of bouncy low effort way but in a charming way if you will because this game is pretty good. You traverse levels and attack people with the right analog stick moving it every which way like a projectile doesn't matter what weapon it is it acts like a projectile. Depending on what weapon you have your character model changes you usually attack rats and like little wolf little things I don't know what the hell they are actually just your basic dungeon style enemies or overworld style enemies in Dungeons and Dragons like games it's an open world game you go to various towns occasionally buying stuff at the shops or saving at the little obelisks you also go in little dungeons with caves and whatnot with multiple um, floors of which you gather resources open chests and try to level up and uh, equip the best items to defeat all the enemies. The game is super focused on you healing a whole bunch throughout the game because there's multiple slots which you will put as many healing items as you can in each slot to make sure you survive each layer of the dungeon. The music is fitting, not exactly something you'd want to listen to outside of the game but definitely something that matches the tone that the game is going for. This game very much gives me like RuneScape vibes when it comes to the layout of the fantasy world. Mix with a little bit of Haven and Hearth, if you remember that free MMO. The game's pixel art kind of reminds me of Legend of Dungeon, that old game on PC. Albeit Legend of Dungeon was a 3D game, whereas this is more like 2.5D with a heavy emphasis on 2D. Despite the fact you have to pay a little bit more than the rest of the games on this list, I'd say pick this up the most out of any games that you're going to see today because this is the true hidden gem of this video, which is why I included it. It's totally not because one of the games I chose before recording happened to be handheld only so I had to pick this as a backup. Next up is a game of which that I bought on the Japanese eShop with some free uh, points I got from physical Japanese cartridges. It's a game called Exit Man Deluxe. You'll notice a lot of games have either Deluxe or some other additive to the title like Returns, SE, Remake, Plus, what have you. This game visually takes after any sort of exit sign you might see in your day-to-day -day life or entrance sign if you will when you're uh, out and about and touch grass. It takes after a classic Japanese format for a game show where basically the ceiling comes down on you and you have to make sure to fit in between those gaps and ideally you want to make sure to go through the actual door which is a smaller portion of the gap therefore giving you more points. Now there's several modes, there's like a 1 versus 100 sort of thing, kind of like a battle royale. There's a, there's a mode where you can face AI, or is it real players, I don't know. There's a level based gauntlet style mode where basically you have to meet the certain requirements that the level uh, gives you in order to get a reward, whether that be coins or costumes or whatever, and costumes are a major part of the game. Basically you can either do the sort of gacha pawn style thing where you uh, pay for a random sort of thing to give you a costume, or you can buy costumes with the coins you earn from playing the various modes of the game. This kind of feels like a WarioWare minigame turned into a real game, you know, like a real game that you pay money for. It's very much got that sort of Japanese uh, low budget indie game feel. Oh, and I love green, so this game is right up my alley. The multiplayer mode that may or may not be AI is definitely based off real people with real win and loss records. I mean, they definitely play similar, some of them do, some of them die immediately, some of them give quite a competition. But depending on if you win or lose, you either go up a rank or go up a few points to get a new rank, or you lose points and potentially lose a rank. Even if you tie, like die at the same time, you still lose points. They don't treat that as like neutral. It's a pretty simple game, so there's not actually much to say about it, so I'll leave it at that. I've been recording takes for this video on Audacity periodically, and uh, in between recording takes, I actually uploaded a video, which you've already seen on my channel, or maybe you haven't. It was called Thingamajig 
weeks. That was just whipped up in a day to be able to get something out in the meanwhile while making this video. I had originally intended this to be the comeback video, you know, after uh, Christmas and uh, New Year's. Life got in the way and I just needed something easy to get my creative juices flowing for the New Year's, you know? Anyway, let's get back to the topic at hand. Next up is a game that oddly enough does not have an additive on its title. It's Super Box Delivery Beyond the Horizon. This game is obviously inspired by the likes of Initial D, but it also reminds me of Choro Q, if you remember that franchise all the way back on the Super Nintendo, all the way up to somewhat modern day and like PS3 and whatnot. But it's not a racing game. Basically, it's an auto runner where you're supposed to collect boxes and avoid cars is coming forward and try to put those boxes into the mailboxes. Your deliveries earn you coins which you can use to either customize your car or unlock power-ups such as slow-mo, such as multiple lives, such as a fever mode that gives you a ton of boxes at once with uh, a rainbow outline on each one. If you're not paying attention cars can certainly feel like they come out of nowhere but there's little markers on the uh, HUD that let you know that cars are coming. The HUD oddly enough enough also has a mile marker saying how long you've actually spent driving in the game. I find it kind of useless, but maybe some people will get a thrill out of that. I don't know. There's ramps that you can use to jump over trains. There's obstacles littered all over the road. Depending on what level your power up is, you might be able to burst through some of them without dying and some of them might kill you instantly. Either way, you got to make sure not to veer one way or the other because you will die regardless of how much hearts you have. The environments change frequently enough sometimes you're in a bustling city sometimes you're in a desert sometimes you're in a Japan like area there's seemingly no rhyme or reason where you end up really the cosmetics in the game seemingly do nothing but make your car look cool I don't think they have any in-game advantages if you will you can also unlock other cars in the game but I don't really think that does anything either one thing I forgot to mention about the game is that there's a leveling system to the boxes if you collect enough level 1 boxes they level up into a level 2 box I'm also assuming that if you unlock a certain amount of of level 2 boxes that you get a level 3 box although I'm not that good so I don't know when that happens. The game has a speed up system. The more time you spend in the game per session the more it uh, speeds up to the point where the car becomes very hard to control. The sound effects are punchy and satisfying but the actual game only has one uh, song playing throughout it. It's sort of a generic 80s montage in a movie sort of track you know but like royalty free if you will even though I don't think it is. The graphics the graphics are alright, I mean they're cell shaded and they're sort of nice polygonally if basic. It's got those motion graphics, you know those little lines and those Japanese characters you see in anime and manga like I mentioned before. But the game has this annoying chromatic aberration filter which I wish it would turn off as well as like a fisheye lens to the whole thing which is kind of annoying. Basically it could use an FOV slider like most games on console. Anyway I think that's all I gotta say about that, let's move on to the next game. Let's go ahead and talk about Destructivator SE, a game that is certainly inspired by a certain era of platformers made on MS-DOS, or at least for MS-DOS machines that is. Everything in this game is in a pixel art style, it's very much zoomed out with little micro sort of sprites of various enemies and your character himself. You certainly seem to be in a sort of post-apocalyptic, maybe futuristic city. It's got these dystopian billboards, it's got blinking lights everywhere, it's got destructive lasers, it's got uh, fields of electricity that you can't go past, it's got projectiles everywhere. The game is brutally hard, I mean even though you have a life bar, your life bar is very much dependent on all the crap that's coming at you all at once, which certainly means your health will deplete very quickly, and the more you die slash the more health you lose, the more stars that you lose. Yes, the game has a star system. You will not lose a star if you get hit one time, but past that your stars will slowly start to go down. The goal of the game is to clear all the enemies. Now some enemies are little purple grunts, some enemies are uh, missile launchers or flying ships that look like aliens. There's turrets on the ceilings that fire homing projectiles. Like I said, shit is flying at you everywhere. Your chance of dying is super high. The game certainly 
strongly encourages you to try it over and over again. Not much of a story to the game, but when you start a level, there's a quote attached to somebody mysterious with a sort of email-like quality to the message. The game has a good soundtrack, a very good soundtrack, but the sound effects are a little bit too loud at times, and you can't exactly hear it at every moment. I'm assuming you can change that in the settings, but the base settings have the sound effects way louder than they should be. The sound effects are super annoying though, regardless of how loud they are. The game has a sort of satisfying movement. There certainly is a small level of strategy when it comes to fighting enemies. You have a machine gun that will never really run out of ammo. You also have a ship that can fire projectiles from below, although the movement on that is a little less satisfying than the actual ground control. This is ground control to Major Tom. I'm moving on to the next game. Next I'm talking about yet another Japanese eShop game that I bought with points from physical cartridges. It's 10 Second Run Returns. 10 Second Run Returns is another rage style game where basically you have 10 seconds, I know funny enough it's in the name, to beat a hard as nails level that once you beat it you unlock the next, you unlock the next, you unlock the next until you lock another set of levels. The game has a run button which is first I didn't really use because I didn't know you had to, but some levels it's essential. The game gives you an infinite number of retries, and all that stands between you and the next level is a 1, 2, 3, and a go. There are stars to collect throughout each level, which makes the levels infinitesimally harder. There are three to collect per level. Now the game does in fact store what time it takes for you to beat the level, but as far as I know there's no real reward for beating it really fast or just before the time limit expires. The wall jumping in the game is super finicky. I've beat over 50 levels and still I really don't have a grasp on how the wall jumping actually works. Each level is meticulously laid out in a way that makes them different from one another. They all have gimmicks that pose a different challenge each time varying in difficulty. Funny enough, the footage that I recorded is mostly made up of one level, that being the 50th level, which I thought would be the end of it, but it turns out it fakes you out and it's like, oh, there's actually 51 to 100 you have to beat now. Haha, -ha, sucker. Yeah, actually, funny enough, I only beat like three levels in this entire gameplay footage that I'm showing you. The game also has a death counter, which I think is just there to rub it in your face how many times you died. The music in the game is high-paced and frantic, and the sound effects are nice and punchy, like with all the sound effects. Punchy is the word of the day. Punch, punch. Money, Money blow. blow! Money blow! The game, like many games on this list, has skins that you can unlock through beating levels and unlocking stars in this particular instance. I'm not even kidding you. I didn't know this was a thing until I opened the menu just by happenstance on recording. How funny is that? There's also a versus battle mode and a battle royal mode, but unfortunately I wasn't able to play those things for you because I don't got any friends. Wamp wamp. But you've heard me ramble enough about this game, let's move on to the next one. Next up is a Qbert clone. It's freaking Totes the Goat. Let me explain Totes the Goat slash Qbert gameplay for you non-retro enthused zoomers slash Generation Alpha people, whatever you're called. And I guess millennials as well if they live under a rock. You can troll a goat slash a weird ass creature named Qbert on an isometric block based field where there are enemies hopping about trying to kill you and you're trying to collect coins, you're trying to change whatever color the tiles are into the color that beats the level. In this case, the game plan I'm showing it's sort of a grassy yellowy green to a blue, but the theme can change. You will in fact see that I recorded more than one theme. The theme often changes in Qbert as well. Now on Qbert's arcade version, you controlled it with an X-shaped uh, joystick. But because the Nintendo Switch comes with two shitty Joy-Cons, they either have faulty analog sticks or a shitty D-pad that basically is just four buttons. Except the Switch Lite, but it's not much better. How do you control this game? That being totes the goat. Well, I'll tell you how. There's five different control schemes. The one I went with is one where you use the analog stick to point in any direction and you press a button to move forward. Totes the goat basically has a sort of bleepy bloopy soundtrack as well as uh, bleepy bloopy uh, sound effects. It's voxel based but it's definitely going for that sort of retro style aesthetic. I mentioned earlier that you collect coins but you actually use the coins for unlocking the characters of which you control the game with. I actually control the chef at some point and it changed the theme. Look at that. The enemies follow you in a sort of Pac-Man ghost like behavior. You can run them off the edge and that will give you more points. Points being the way 
way to uh, prove that you're a mega giga chat in this game. Just like a real arcade game, like Hubert. There are also spikes you have to deal with, and there's obstacles that you can't get past. Basically meaning that every level has a different path to victory. The game encourages you to get as many tiles turn the same color in a row as possible, because you get more points that way. And I'm done talking about it. I mean, come the fuck on. Did you really expect me to give like a TED talk on how this game is like the best game ever? It's a fucking Cuber clone. What do you expect? So I just found this out. I was perusing the eShop and in between me recording the actual footage of Totes the Goat and sitting down and recording it on a microphone, I found out that uh, there was a sort of spiritual successor to Totes the Goat made by the same publisher, a Tui, called Knights of the Rogue Dungeon that appears to be another Cuber clone. It's a roguelite with sort of upgrades and better graphics and more lighting effects and it costs $10 so maybe get that instead. I don't know. I haven't played it. So now for realsies I'm done. The game I'm about to show you is a, another arcade style clone. This one is copying off of Buster Brothers slash Pang. It's Pirate Pop Plus! Given the sticker that you can unlock in this game, I think this is published or maybe even developed by the same people who developed Runbow. The game is a square, monochromatic Game Boy style screen surrounded by a fake game console that you can decorate to your pleasure. You play as a sailor who is in a boxed area which you can shoot a harpoon at bubbles to make them smaller and if the bubbles hit you, they hurt you. The one dealing out said bubbles is a pirate who shows up which you can hurt hurt and get points off of or coins. There's power-ups like any sort of good arcade game would have like a gun that you can shoot or there's a harpoon that uh, latches onto the wall and is guaranteed to hit a bubble from either side. The pirate also changes gravity from one screen to another. During that time you can hop on a bubble and pop it and get extra points that way depending on how many bubbles you pop before you land on the ground. If you gather up enough coins you can either spend those coins on aesthetic unlockables like uh, stickers on your console. You can unlock new characters which I have never done. You can unlock new music that you can play throughout the levels. You can unlock a new color for the backlight. You can unlock new colors for the buttons, for the LCD overlay, for all sorts of things on your fake little Game Boy like console. Or you can risk it all for hyper mode. That being if you pay up 25 coins, you unlock the ultimate Sigma move of two times score. But beware, you only have one heart, and if you lose, you can't get your money back. <laughs> so basically, you have to collect 25 coins or more in this mode, or it's otherwise useless. There's a multiplier counter telling you how many bubbles you popped without missing. Popping more bubbles in a row does give a tangible gameplay benefit, either giving you power-ups or more coins. There's also like food items that give you bonus points, and there's like a two times power up that gives you double the points per pop. You can also collect out letters that spell bonus, which I'm assuming gives you a massive bonus. Funny that. Another pretty simple game in the books, although one that I spent way too much time on recording. Although I will say the music is repetitive, but kind of accurate to the Game Boy, I would think, maybe a little bit too complex. And the graphics are very easy and readable, and definitely something you would actually see on a Game Boy. In my opinion. Although it would have to be like an insane megabit cartridge in order to fit all that, if you could even do that, like in 2024. Oh shit, I forgot to mention this, but I also bought this with uh, Japanese shop points from uh, cartridges. I do that a lot. I guess that's my cue to move on. The penultimate game before the last game I show you, the one that is developed by Fly High Works, a publisher that is no stranger to releasing games under $5 or sometimes exactly $5. It's Ninja Strike not to be confused with its sequel, Ninja Smasher, which is above $5. I was originally going to talk about Kamiko, which is published by the same company, but it is way more often talked about than Ninja Striker. Or is it Kamiko? I don't know. Either way, I want to be a contrarian and talk about Ninja Striker. Ninja Striker sees you play as a ninja. Several ninjas, in fact, depending on which one you want to play with. I briefly played as Ninja, then switched to Chainsickle, which I played throughout most of this gameplay session, because because he is objectively the best character and controls mwah, chef's kiss, beautiful. And I briefly played a 
is Robot Ninja, but I gave up on that pretty quickly and stopped recording. Ninja Striker is a chain-based uh, platformer where you attack enemies in a sort of uh, line-based movement. Given how much time it takes to beat the level, given how much life you have, given what your maximum combo was, and given what your total score, including all of this was, will dictate your star ranking, whether it be one, two, or three stars. At the end of each set of levels is a boss fight that if you do the same sort of thing that I just mentioned well, you get a good star rank. Excluding a combo, however, because it's only one enemy that you have to fight. The game is very much themed after classic Japanese folklore, given that it is a ninja game. You fight spoopy ghost creatures, fellow ninjas, you fight kappas, common snakes and frogs, just your basic sort of ninja affair. The game is not completely mindless, but at times it does feel a tad bit repetitive the way you have to go through each sort of level. Especially as the levels go on, they get more and more clever where you have to think more and more. There are coins to collect throughout the level, which I think only just give you points. There are blocks that send you in one direction that can chain together to create a sort of Sonic-like sort of pipe system, if you will, but instead in the air. Each character plays different enough, have a different sort of attack and life bar. I did not play as the Kanoichi, so I don't know how she plays. Each character presents a different challenge. I do think the Chainsickle guy is a lot easier than, say, the Robot Ninja or the Ninja, who I think is the hardest to play all the way through. Maybe the Kanoichi's hardest, I don't know. The graphics are pretty simple, sort of fake Super Nintendo-y, if you will. The music is fine enough, I guess, but the actual sound effects are way out of proportion volume-wise with the actual music. And plus, the sound effects are non-stop, so uh, you would have to either just turn them down completely or crank up the music to an unbearable bearable degree to be able to hear it consistently. The UI is also flooded with these numbers that appear everywhere and little souls that come out of the enemies. It's kind of a clusterfuck. But hey, it's only five bucks, so I would say this is a worthwhile package in and of itself. It's nice, cheap fun that you can have over a few days. The constant death pits is a little annoying, but eh, you'll get over it real quick. Funny enough, this last game has a similar name to a uh, more well-known game known as Dark Souls. Yes, this game is called Duck Souls. But believe it or not, the only reason why it's called Duck Souls is not because it's actually a clone of Dark Souls. It's not. It's because in the game, in the beginning, you talk to Duck Souls that tell you to beat the game in some way. For you see, you play as a duck who has to platform through levels to make it to the end. Why the hell am I talking like this? Anyway, it's Duck Souls Plus. Duck Souls Plus is a game that I also own on PC, but I decided to show it off on the Switch version. I don't know why it's called Plus. There's literally no difference between this and the PC version, which is not called Plus. You can play the game with either checkpoints in the middle of the levels or no checkpoints at all. As you play more of the levels, you unlock silly hats. In the game, you can move forward, you can jump, you can air dash, and you can also jump on walls. At the beginning of each level, there's some dumb quote that I usually ignore. If you die, you can pretty much start again instantly and the game will keep track of how many times you die. Each set of levels has a different theme and a different song. The levels certainly get harder as you go along. The music in the game is freaking fantastic, although it is repetitive given that it only plays one song per each set of levels. The graphics are very basic, although I do like the art style that it does present. Even on easy mode, I can see why it's called Duck Souls given that it is just as hard as Dark Souls. Although I didn't show it, the game also has a speedrun mode where you can have a timer throughout the whole game to see how fast you can beat it in one go. The game's not very long to begin with, seeing as I have beaten it before. That's all I pretty much want to talk about with this game. The only thing I will say is that when the duck dies, he does splatter in a pool of pixelated blood. But other than that, I think I'm good, so I'm going to call it there. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I know it took a while for this to come out, but so be it. Anyway, peace! <laughs>